It's a well-known fact in the office that I was totally opposed to wind farms. Um, Norfolk is a very level, flat um, county, known as the county of the big skies. And my opinion was that to put a turbine 100 metres tall when the blade was upright in the Norfolk landscape would be totally unacceptable. I've got to admit, I'd never actually seen a turbine in life. I'd seen photographs, but never a real one. But I was convinced that the process would be wrong. It would be just totally alien. It looked like something out of War of the Worlds. I later um, read the environmental impact assessment, of course, once the application was submitted, and I started to realise that there were other reasons to look at wind energy, reduction of pollution, for instance. I then watched some of the early stages of the Swatham turbine being built, and instead of seeing uh, the tripod from all the worlds going up, I saw a very graceful structure. And when completed, it did not detract from the landscape, and it did not, did not detract from the Swatham conservation area. It is quite an attractive structure. Well, it's not possible to put wind energy developments anywhere where a developer might like. The first step in the development process is really site selection. And what tends to happen in the process is that sites that have special qualities are avoided. So, for example, if we're considering the effects on landscape, people will try and avoid sites that are designated at the national level, such as areas of outstanding natural beauty in England and Wales and national scenic areas in Scotland. People should go and look at them. People should uh, take the opportunity when a developer offers a, a site visit to go and see them, to go and hear them, to go and look at them and to, um, to judge for themselves what the turbines look in reality and how they are perceived from the landscape. Clearly at the present time there are government policies and guidelines into the amount of renewable energy we're going to have to produce. But at the present time they do not override local considerations. People should be reassured that the planning process screens all these applications rigorously. They can be assured that we will not just allow any turbine to go up in any location because clearly not every site is acceptable for a wind turbine and we'll make sure they will go in the right place at the right time. Most of the people who come to the Ecotech Centre come with some fairly strong opinions, a lot of them anti. They go away having changed those opinions and we get a lot of feedback on our feedback uh, that says we really hadn't realised how nice they were, how comfortable you can be with them, uh, that they don't uh, threaten, uh, that, that they are quite beautiful and they blend well into the environment. A few months ago I had a phone call from Aberdeen Council and it was the Community Council. I believe there's a proposal there for a wind farm and they wanted to come through to Adrossen to see for themselves and I met them at the wind farm. There was perhaps about 50 of them. Some were already in favour of it but some were very much against it. And we walked around the wind farm and the first thing they said was there's no noise. And I said, well, that's right. We were told there would be very little noise. Uh, and in actual fact, you don't hear them at all. I think the nearest house is perhaps 800 metres away and there's certainly no noise. They could see for themselves what it was actually like. And I would say the majority, by the time the bus left that day, were quite comfortable with the fact that a wind farm was going to be built in their area. The target is that we'd like 10% of our electricity coming from renewables by 2010, that's the end of the decade, and uh, solar power will play a contribution and, and other forms of renewables, but most of that will be coming from the wind turbine. So that's the target, 10%. And then 10 years on, by 2020, we have what we call an aspiration that it could be as much as uh, as 20%. So we're, we're very keen on renewables and very committed to it as a government. There'll always be local issues about um, a particular planning application for a wind farm, but I think a growing number of people in Britain and indeed throughout the world are now worried about climate change, they're worried about global warming, they understand the arguments and they recognise that we need cleaner sources of energy and therefore more and more people I meet among the public are open-minded about wind farms and recognise actually that we do need more of them. Well, I've been a planning officer for 30 years and until I dealt with the first Swatham turbine I hadn't realised how detailed some applications could be. 
and the Swaffham turbine had the longest, deepest consultation process that I'd ever been through at that time, involving the telecoms people, the uh, Ministry of Defence, civil aviation authorities. Almost everybody had a finger to put in the pie before we could ever make a recommendation to our committee. Generally, we look at the impact on local residents. If you get them too close, it's like putting a matchstick in front of your face. If you hold it too close, it looks like a telegraph pole. But if you keep it far enough away, then it looks like a, like a matchstick. So we do take into account the local view. We, we assess how it's going to affect them. We have to be uh, assured that the access to the site is acceptable. We have to be satisfied that it's not going to interfere with something like, for instance, television signals, uh, which happened in the Swaffham case uh, and had to be rectified. We have to make sure that if there's going to be a tourism aspect, are people going to start flocking to the site to look at the turbine, which has been a real fear in some cases. The uh, technical story and commercial story of wind is truly remarkable. Um, the present generation of turbines is, is the last of a, uh, probably 10 or 12 since I've been involved. And during that time, the cost of energy from, from wind in the last, say, 20 years has gone down by a factor of about five. So it's moved from something which was essentially smocks and sandals to something which is now competing directly with conventional, so-called conventional generation. And from an engineering point of view, that, that's a truly remar remarkable story. In, in wind in turbine terms, it's gone from something about 12 metres in diameter to something about 120 metres in diameter in prototype stage. So we now have something with no fuel risk, because uh, we have indigenous wind, with clear costs. So the costs are the capital costs which uh, uh, you have to pay for building the thing and buying the turbines, a small operations and maintenance cost, so you have secure supply at a known cost. And that cost now, on a, in a purely cash basis, on a good side, is comparable to conventional generation. So the question is not, what's the justification? The question is, what's the justification for not using wind? Well, you should be worried about the fact that our world is getting warmer, that um, we're using too much energy from fossil fuels that puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and it accumulates there, and gradually, it will, through a, a greenhouse effect, cause global warming. So why you should be worried is that that will have many effects on the way that the world lives. Uh, the sea levels uh, will rise, probably around a meter or so in, in the next century, and that will completely swamp out low-lying areas. There will be increasing chances of events like hurricanes, as we've just seen in uh, New Orleans, uh, they will become more frequent. And of course the uh, climate in our country will change. Not everywhere uh, for the worse, uh, but many places for the worse. It's extraordinary really, but people still don't understand how urgent climate change is as an issue. They still think it's something they can address tomorrow rather than today. But all the data coming in now, all the data from melting ice caps, what's happening to the permafrost, if you look wherever you, you find incidents of climate change impacts around the world, the data shows us we need to move now, not tomorrow. That's why it's so important to get our renewables policy in order. And in terms of the things that can make the biggest impact in the shortest period of time, it's wind that is there to be had right now. The RSPB believes that the changing climate, global warming, climate chaos is in the medium to long term going to be the thing that affects our wildlife probably more than anything else. And there's scientific evidence and the RSPB was part of this study that shows that about a third of species, birds and plants and mammals on Earth, could be committed to extinction in the next 50 years by climate change. So this is a massive impact on the whole world and its wildlife. So that's why we're really worried about it. And of course, it's going to have massive impacts on our species as well. I think we 